So let's continue now with our spinal nerves. <laughs> and uh, I wanted to introduce the two motor components in your uh, ventral root. Your ventral root, if you recall, was coming from your anterior horn cell. It was coming out here. And this would be our ventral root. But I wanted you to know that there was something other than just the, what we call the alpha efferent is the somatic motor component. coming from the anterior horn. So this would be a alpha efferent fiber coming from that cell. But there are gamma efferents, which are smaller. And they also will go out over your ventral root and go out with your spinal nerve eventually. And these are. Um, muscle spindles Has anybody ever seen a muscle spindle in a uh, tissue sample? They're, they're beautifully designed. What are they for? They're a stretch receptor. But I just wanted you to know that there were two kinds of fibers going in your ventral root. Now, let's take a cross section of our, we can just put it here, a cross section of a spinal nerve. And we'll start with just the nerve fibers. Taking a cross section of them. And these then would be nerve fibers. And they'll be covered with con connective tissue, the connective tissue surrounding a single nerve fiber is called what? You know? Endoneurium. Endoneurium. So around each one of these single fibers that can either be afferent or efferent, so our rust color is the endoneurium. And these are gathered together with connective tissue, which will gather them in bundles. So what are you going to call these? Perineurium, right? Perineurium, just around again. Perineurium. And then the whole group of fibers are surrounded with heavy connective tissue. Giving us the what? Epineurium, right. So when you are dissecting and you pick up a nerve, you're picking up out here. This, this whole thing then could be just a cross section. Let's just take the ulnar nerve. 
so you see how well it's defined in here. When you study pharmacology, certain drugs will penetrate some of these, some will not. So one learns different things about this particular structure. So now, another term I want to introduce, the term plexi. Have you heard of plexus, plexi? You have several major plexi. I'm only going to mention two. Can I take? No, I'll wait for that. If you so plexi, that's plural, plexus, singular. We have the brachial plexus, and we have the lumbosacral plexus, lumbosacral. So now you know where they are. Why do we need these plexi? Because we've added appendages. So when the nerves are going to go out, they're going to recombine as they leave the cord and form a plexus. There are many divisions of these plexi, but we're just going to introduce the concept to you. So we've recombined spinal nerves. to make plexi. So roughly we could say, let's go C5, C6, C7, and C8, and T1. Those are all coming out individually, but they can combine into different nerves. And the one that I'm going to give you will combine all of them. It's going to go out like this, like this, like this this and this and give us a single nerve. That's a plexi. And that particular nerve that I've developed here will be the radial nerve. This obviously is in our brachial plexus because the three combined for the brachial plexus C5 to T1. And the radial nerve will go to the extensors of the forearm. Extensors, forearm. So what's going to happen when you cut it? How are you going to know that you've cut the radial nerve? Tell somebody to salute. Instead of doing this, they'll do this, right? You have what's called wrist drop, because you have nothing to extend your wrist, right? You've cut the radial nerve. So a wrist drop if you cut. The medial nerve on the anterior surface is also a combination of C5 through T1. And the medial nerve, then, will be dealing with flexors. Has anybody ever damaged a medial nerve? Some people will use their hand for a hammer. Medial nerve comes right to the surface there, will damage it. What can't you do if your medial nerve is damaged? You can't make a fist, a complete fist. Can't make fist. Actually, it's, it's since sometimes these two latter fingers are not involved, but you can't do at least with the first three but it gives you an idea of why the, they have to combine these as these cells, these muscle cells are migrating out. They form a different pattern. They can't just do like the thoracic cavity does, just come straight around, right? All right, so that's our um, plexi. The next we want to do is what happens when you injure the nervous system. 
or a nerve, a nerve, a spinal nerve. Has anybody injured a spinal nerve? Anybody cut them? Nobody? So this will be injury. Now, the degree of degeneration after you've cut a nerve will depend on location. Degree of degeneration depend on location. What do I mean by that? Here I have my nerve cell with its axon. And I cut it at A. What happens when I cut at A? Usually the cell will die. You're that close to insulting your soma. If I cut peripherally or distally at B, we have several things that can occur. But what we're going to do is follow first degeneration and then regeneration. So let's take a We'll make a new nerve cell here. And we're going to cut it. Well, we'll do it this way. And we have myelin around it. We'll just put on two segments of myelin. And we'll put some down here. It'll be on the fiber. On the proximal end of cut, we'll have degeneration back to the first node of Ranvier. Degeneration. back to first node of Ranvier. And we know that we've damaged this proximal part by changes that are taking place in the cell body. So in the cell body, in the soma, the process of chromatolysis have you heard of chromatolysis? Chromatolysis occurs. Chromatolysis. This is in the injured nerve cell. And what do we see with chromatolysis? How do we know this particular nerve is damaged? Well, first, the soma will take in water, so it will swell. Soma swells. That swelling will then displace the nucleus, so the nucleus becomes eccentric. Nucleus eccentric. And the nissel substance, which is normally fairly equally distributed throughout the cytoplasm, the nissel substance then will go to the periphery with the swelling. Nissel to periphery. All of this is taking place in the soma. So your nerve cell, instead of looking this way with nissel dispersed all throughout, you'll have a cell which is considerably larger 
The Nissel will be over here in the periphery. And the nucleus will be eccentric over to the side. So three characteristics of knowing whether you've got a healthy nerve cell or not. Now, as we come back to our cut, we've cut, taken this part, our proximal part, chromatolysis here, degeneration back to the first node of Ranvier. In the distal segment, what will happen in the distal segment? Well, the first place, the axon will break up. Just little beads of axon left. So the axon breaks up. And the Schwann cells multiply. So you're going to increase the number of Schwann cells out here so that they've got a Schwann cell lined tube. Schwann cells cells multiply. So if you don't have any scar tissue where your cut was, as the soma recovers, they will send out sprouts from the axon across the gap. One of them can find your Schwann tube and go down and make contact with the target. So with regeneration, the proximal axon sprouts and one of them will find the Schwann tube. Sometimes you have trouble and they get all mixed, <coughs> mixed up in the gap here and you form a neuroma, none of them can find the pathway. Sometimes if scar tissue comes and builds scar across here, a surgeon can cut out the scar and put in a Dacron tube. So when the sprout comes, it'll follow that little tube and get into the proper channel. So there are ways to help. How fast is it traveling once it's in the Schwann? tube, it can tra travel as fast as three to four millimeters per day. That's fast. What's the rap most rapid growth of a nerve fiber that we know, that I know at least, in the animal kingdom? <laughs> in the deer antler. You know, the deer shed their uh, antlers every year and they've got that to get the velvet all re -innervated. It's highly sensitive. It can go about five millimeters there. I always think someday somebody's going to go analyze and find out what substance is in the ganglion that allows that to grow so fast and use it with human beings when they damage their cord because it's really something. Someday somebody will do it. All right, so that gives you an idea of what we mean by uh, regeneration, but let's say that you've cut a neuron, but you don't get chromatolysis. Why not? You're given some slides to study, and you have no chromatolysis, yet you know you've cut the neuron. So if I have why no chromatolysis after nerve cut, Well, here we have our nerve cell. Here's its axon. Here's some myelin.
very diagrammatically placed. And this nerve is cut. And you still have a perfectly healthy nerve cell. Why? Because axons can send out branches. Branches of axons come out just where they can between Schwann cells in a node of Ranvier. So I'm going to bring out a branch from this axon here going in the same direction as the parent axon. But this one's cut. But we have what's known as a collateral. A collateral, that's a branch from an axon. And it can go in the same direction, or it can go back up here. Can ascend or descend. But that's the reason you can have no chromatolysis when you've cut a parent nerve fiber because of collaterals. Did you know that the greatest input to your cerebral cortex are collaterals? From pyramidal cells that are leaving your cortex, this is cortex, it's got cell going out, but it's also sending back up collaterals. And the greatest input from all that's coming all over your body, the greatest input is from pyramidal cell axons, collaterals, pyramidal cell collaterals, which are axons, but they're coming from a parent cell. So you can figure that one out for the dynamics. Reinforcement, what's it doing? Is that what happens when we repeat constantly? Who knows? But I thought that was fascinating, and that was only found maybe 10 or 15 years ago, not too long ago. So now let's go back to our spinal cord and look at white matter. Last time we had formed what was happening to our gray matter in the spinal cord. Spinal cord. White matter. So we had seen that it come from the marginal layer. We know it's going to be peripheral in the cord. So all around the periphery will be white matter. We'll find that it's divided into, let's put P, L, and A. So the white matter is grouped into what we call funiculi. White matter forms groups of fibers. which are funiculi. And the funiculi are broken down into specific functional groups called fasciculi. Fasciculi are functional groups within Funiculi. So as I showed a slide last time of multiple sclerosis, it was up here in our posterior funiculi. This is the posterior funiculus between the midline and over here. So posterior funiculus. So when you're reading slides, you're saying degeneration, you don't just say white matter, you say posterior funiculus, you know exactly where you are. So this one's going to be the lateral funiculus.
So what does that allow this one to be? Anterior. Really smart, yes. Anterior funiculus. <laughs> but they're useful landmarks. And I'm going to use one for an illustration. I'm just going to take, since the same sensory modality is in the whole of the posterior, I'm going to take the posterior to give you an illustration of what a fasciculus is in a funiculus. So if I take my cord again, there'll be two fasciculi in the posterior funiculus. So medial will have the fasciculus gracilis, fasciculus gracilis. Fasciculus gracilis. What does gracile mean? Pardon? Slender. Slender. It's a real compliment to give somebody how gracile you look today, right? It's slender, so it's a slender one. The lateral one is fasciculus cuneatus. Fasciculus cuneatus. And cuneate means wedge-shaped. <laughs> Don't want to call anybody that, but this is <laughs> wedge-shaped. So it gives you an example that here we have two fasciculi. Why separate? Because the fasciculus gracilis is coming from the lower part of the body, lower body which makes sense. As you're bringing in sensory information, you bring it over to the midline. So as we get to the upper body, it can come to the outer portion. So this would be upper body. What kind of sensations is it bringing? What we call conscious proprioception. Right now, think of your feet. You can see them down there. You're not moving. You know exactly where they are. Proprioception, position in space. Right. When we get to the cerebellum, you'll get unconscious proprioception that goes on every time you take a step. You've got to know where your feet are, but you don't want to be thinking about them, so you turn it over to your cerebellum. But when you want to think about it, that's conscious proprioception. So the sensory modality carried by these fibers up to the cortex is conscious proprioception. Very important. Try yourself out at night when it's dark. See what you know where the light switch is. All these kind of things. It's fun. It's good training for you. So that gives you an idea of what fasciculi are within fasciculus. Now the whole white matter is filled with fasciculi. And we're going to take an ascending pathway today and a descending pathway. Just so you get the general idea. Now I'm going to give it to you very briefly, not all the ramifications, just so you see the basics. I'm taking pain and temperature as my ascending pathway. It's so beautifully laid out and embryologically how it develops is amazing. So we're going to take an ascending pathway. And the sensory modalities will be pain and temperature. That's how you get pain up to consciousness, because we've got to come from the periphery out here and get up to your cerebral cortex. When you took your shower this morning, how did you know whether it was the right temperature or not? If you didn't have this pathway, you'll scald yourself, right? This is letting you know pain and temperature. Why pain? Well, pain sensing is essential to your survival, letting you know when you've got something that's too much. Essential to survival. 
but it's also an enemy. When you get to be older and you've got terminal cancer and no medication will handle the pain, when you have intractable pain, pain is an enemy. With intractable pain. I mean, you're lucky, you get a little problem and you take a Tylenol or something. But there are times when nothing that we know will get rid of it. What they'll do is go cut the dorsal roots if they have to, to cut the input coming into the cord. But that's pretty drastic. But anyhow, pain, phenomenal. We have all kinds of pain. Have you ever thought about pain? <laughs> Not if you can help it. You have pain that is sharp, pain that's dull, pain that's burning, all different degrees of pain. Sharp, burning, dull. And a fascinating study is referred pain. When you have something going on someplace, like appendicitis, frequently it aches around your umbilicus. You think you've got a problem here when the problem's here. It's referred. So referred pain, that's a major one. I worked on that for my master's degree because it was after the war and the fellows were coming back without any limbs. And yet their limbs were hurting and there was no limb there. You had to figure out what had happened to the nerves to cause that limb to hurt when there's nothing there. So it, referred pain is a, a big area. So now let's look at, oh, um, Let's follow pain. We're going to need a whole page. Oh, the cultural pain. I think that's what's fun. Some people get cut, and they're so vocal. They just don't stop talking about it. Others will get cut, and they're so stoic. Oh, I cut myself and go on. Which are you? <laughs> Have to ask your friends, right? No, I studied this once, and boy, some great, big, massive fellows couldn't take any pain at all. And some little tiny fellow, barely any muscles at all. <laughs> Get some pain, just take it. He was so stoic. It was just amazing, the difference. Which are you? You're stoic, okay. <laughs> it's easier on your friends when you're stoic, I guess. All right, so. What we're going to do is start at the bottom of a page, because we're going to bring pain in, but we've got to get it all the way to the cortex. So we're going to be taking different slices as it goes up. All right? So we'll start with our first cross-section down here. And then we'll have our next one coming up here. And our next one up here. And since we don't have much room, we're going to have to move over and take the cortex up here, because that's our eventual destination. So this will be a cross-section of cord. This will be another cross-section of cord. This will be a cross-section through thalamus. And this will be up to the, you have a central sulcus here, if you recall, central sulcus on our cerebral hemispheres. And we're going to bring in sensation to the post-central gyrus. So our pain and temperature is coming up to this part of your cortex, post-central gyrus. So we've got to come in with, with these ascending pathways, there are three neurons There's in the pathway, a primary neuron, secondary neuron, and a tertiary neuron. So we're going to have a primary neuron, and that's going to be in your DRG. What does DRG stand for? 
dorsal root ganglia. We're not going to write it out anymore. And the secondary neuron is going to be in the posterior horn. Secondary neuron. be in the posterior horn. Where's the tertiary neuron going to be? What, where do all sensations go through before they go to the cortex? Thalamus. Tertiary neurons in the thalamus. So when you get a quiz and you're asked that you've damaged your secondary neuron, you know exactly where it is, where it's going, and you could hypothesize what the result would be. So we're going to follow our primary neuron up. So we need our DRG out here. And we're coming in then. Cut your little finger severely. You've got this pseudo unipolar cell over your dorsal root, and it's going to come just to the lateral aspect of your cord. I've got to put in my, notice I'm not bringing my posterior horn all the way to the surface. It doesn't come all the way to the surface. Now, if anybody can figure out why these have these patterns, I don't know. But it's going to come to an area out here between the posterior horn and the surface of the cord. Anybody know what fasciculus that is? It's named after Mr. Lissauer. This will be Lissauer's fasciculus. I remember taking my class over for the neurosurgeons once, and they asked if they knew the name, and he was so pleased that they knew Lissauer's fasciculus. What happens here now, and this is the question, why? I'm not synapsing here. I'm just entering and traveling up to my next segment out here. Why does it do that? Why doesn't it come right into the dorsal horn? So this axon now will ascend one or two segments. Terribly important in figuring out lesions. Ascend one to two segments. And then it will turn and come in to the dorsal horn. And it's going to come into an area which is called the substantia gelatinosa. This area here, no, I want yellow. And this area is substantia gelatinosa. Have you ever heard of it before? No? Why do we have a gelatinous part of our cord here? Nobody knows. Nobody's really gone in and assayed it. We're driven by technology. You get new technology, you leave back all the old things. Don't bother to go look them up. Substantia gelatinosa. So in the substantia gelatinosa, we're going to have our secondary neuron. So we'll pick it up. And it does something interesting. Here's our secondary neuron. It's going to cross over to my lateral funiculus down in this white commissure down here. 
and come over to here. Don't bring it to the surface because it's very important. It doesn't come to the surface. So this is the anterior white commissure. Why do I make an issue of it? Anterior white commissure. Because there are certain diseases where the central canal boundaries degenerate. And if they degenerate, what are they going to do? They're going to cut off your pain and temperature fibers that are crossing there. So it's an important landmark in your cord. So I'm coming over to form a track. This now has to go on up to our thalamus. But it's going to ascend over here in the lateral funiculus as it goes up to where I'm going to get into the thalamus. So it forms a track out here. All of the fibers will be P and T, pain and temperature fibers. So this tract is called the spino, where it's beginning, thalamic tract. Spino, thalamic tract. And since it's in the lateral funiculus, it's the lateral spinal thalamic. When you study this, you'll find out there are others. I'm only giving you the very simplest. This is lateral spinal thalamic tract. So if you have to cut the cord for any reason, you don't want to cut there, you'll cut off pain and temperature. You've got to know what else is around there. And we're going to go up in our thalamus then. Was, I'm just going to make a little block up here on each side of the third ventricle. This is going to be my thalamus. And these fibers will come in and synapse and I'll have my third neuron. And it has to go on up, coming up to my postcentral gyrus. And that's where you'll have most refined interpretation of pain once you get up to the cortex. So when we get up to the cortex, thank you, refined interpretation of pain. But I'll say one thing, because I want to show a slide of it. The body is represented on the postcentral gyrus in an upside down manner. So if I have a pain in my toe, my toe will be sending its fibers up here. My face will be down here. Why? What do we call that? The upside down representation of man homunculus. I'll show you a picture of a homunculus. It's the motor and sensory. We have to show next time going motor down. We brought sensory up. Homunculus sensory representation of body on cortex. That's again very important because you can get rid of your anterior cerebral artery which supplies this area. What supplies this area? Middle cerebral, right. Very important for blockage of arteries to know the position of these. Let's see by slides, please. have a cross section of a peripheral nerve. This is called a scanning electron microscope. You can see your blood vessels. You can see the individual nerve fibers that will have the endoneurium. Then a group will have the perineurium. 
and the whole thing will have the epineurium. But this could be your ulnar nerve. Look at how vascularized it is. In the next one, this is just to show the distribution of the nerves to the surface. It's a whole field in itself, dermatomes. But you see what they're very clear here for, this is T10, T9, T8, T7 in the thorax. But when it comes to the arms, they're different. You'll have T2 in here, and you'll have T1 here, because you have plexi up here, which are recombining the nerves as they go to your limbs. In the next one, and these are just normal nerve cells filled with nissel, filled with healthy nuclei. If we cut the axon then, this close, it'll die, but what you'll see first is swelling, peripherally displaced nissel, and eccentric or peripheral nucleus. Next one. And this is the cord with the fasciculus cuneatus here, fasciculus gracilis here, and we're following Here's substantia gelatinosa here, but not, this would be your Lysaurus fasciculus out here. In the next, oh, and then we'd have, whoops, I'm sorry, can we go back? I'm sorry, I could use that same slide. Back, please, is it possible? If not, no, back, no, back, there, thank you. Now here's your lateral spinal thalamic tract. You see it's out here. But there's a spinocerebellar out here. So you don't want to have cut through here. You have to get rid, you have to make the decision. Do you want to get rid of cerebellar input to reduce pain by cutting a spinal thalamic input? So you need to know, if you're going into neurosurgery, the position of all of these. In the next one. And then this is our real cord. We'd have our Lysaurus fasciculus here, and then we'd climb up to the next one and come in to your substantia gelatinosa cross over in this anterior white commissure and come on over into the lateral spinal thalamic tract and ascend. In the next one. Now these are real sections of, of brain, so we've got thalamus here. So we're coming up to specific nuclei within the thalamus to have our third neuron. And from there, we're going to go out through the internal capsule, through the corona radiata, up into our sensory cortex. In the next one, and this is showing then, this is our post-central gyrus here. Here's our central sulcus. So sensory is getting post-central gyrus. And the next one, here's our homunculus. You'll have toes way up here at the top. Coming down, lots of hand representation. The biggest representation will be hand and face. But why is face right side up and the rest of the body upside down? Next one. This, oh, this will be for next lecture because we've got to come back down again. All right, we'll stop there. <laughs>